Hi, everybody. Welcome to Kindred Skulls. I'm Matt Fries. I'm here with a solo podcast for you today. Um, if you didn't catch the last podcast that I put out, uh, Nick Olson taking a little bit of a break. Uh, everything's good with him. He just has a lot going on right now. So uh, I'm going to be going solo for a little while. I'm hoping to get Nick back later on in the season. I probably won't be repeating this every single podcast episode, but figure since it's like the second one, I'll do it here. Um, but yeah, let's dive right into it. Uh, we'll start with obviously the Vikings week one victory against the New York Giants. Uh, phenomenal victory. It was, it was the largest margin of, uh, victory in the Kevin O'Connell era for the Vikings. Actually the largest we've had since 2019. They played the Chargers, uh, in LA in a stadium that was apparently like everybody who was there talks about it. Like it was like three quarters Vikings fans in that stadium. Um, but obviously, final score of Vikings Giants, 28 to 6. The Vikings kind of dominate from wire to wire. Um, really great performance, in my opinion, from both sides of the ball. There was a lot of encouraging things that the Vikings did. Obviously, the Giants are probably one of, if not the worst team in the NFL, right? It's kind of them and the Panthers, I feel like, who, who ended up feeling worst in the NFL coming out of week one. And really, I, I, I just don't think there's a lot of talent on that team, right? You have Dexter Lawrence, you have Malik Neighbors, and outside of that, it's, it's kind of a barren wasteland of talent. I should mention Andrew Thomas as well. But, you know, just a, a big win for the Vikings, a great start to the Sam Darnold era as well, right? So into the game, we'll go offense first, then defense on the Vikings, and then we'll flip it over and kind of preview the Giants game. Um, so first thing I wanted to talk about, on the Vikings offense was obviously Sam Darnold, right? New quarterback. It's his, you know, probably his only year with the Minnesota Vikings, right? But in his very first game action, you couldn't really ask for a much better debut. Um, he went 19 to 24 for 208 yards. He also got 36 yards on a defensive pass interference call against Jordan Addison, right? And then through the two touchdowns with the interception, that wasn't his fault. Although I, I did have a ball that I charted as his fault. Um, that he was kind of late on a route over the middle to Addison. Um, so, you know, Darnold overall impressions, like I, I don't think he was really asked to carry the team, but I thought he played really well kind of within the structure of the offense and within himself. Obviously he completed the first 12 of his passes. The Vikings felt like they were able to consistently move the ball throughout the game. So there really wasn't too much to complain about from Darnold's performance here. And you had some absolutely beautiful from throws, right? The 44 yard pass to Justin Jefferson was absolutely incredible. You had a couple of nice anticipation throws on that 99 yard drive uh, to Jordan Addison uh, you saw him take the matchup one-on-one -on, -one on that Justin Jefferson touchdown, right? So there was a lot of good to be encouraged by, particularly when he was on script. And even, I think, when he was under pressure, I, I don't remember what the pressure stats were, but I, I think he ended up grading out pretty well from a PFF perspective. Well, I know he ended up grading out pretty well from a PFF perspective because he was, like, their highest-graded quarterback on the week. I'm not sure if I would I would quite agree with that, but, you know, it was a, a overall – an impressive performance with Darnold for me. You know, he he was facing a fair amount of interior pressure, and it didn't really seem to face him, right? Obviously, he took the early sack, but at the end of the day, like, he was able to navigate through pressure, not take sacks, at least get the ball out, right? There wasn't a ton of scrambling going on, but he was getting the football out pretty quickly on time and generally accurately. Um, you know, with him, I, I think... It'll kind of go where Kevin O'Connell takes it. But there, there was one play I noted where I think Darnold just wasn't on the same page with the rest of the offense. It looked like he was attempting – what the, the Vikings looked like they were running a screen on the play. But Darnold kept his eyes down in the middle of the field, took a regular three-step drop, and then it ended up scrambling. This was like a, a three-yard scramble gain that he had. Um, but it, it was very clear to the left that the Vikings were running a screen. Christian Darisol went downfield – even, you know, as if he was really blocking for the screen. And it would have been an ineligible man downfield penalty had Darnold tried to throw the throw the ball after uh, kind of dropping back to pass, right? Because with the screen, you need to drop back kind of one step and throw the ball right away. Um, you know, it, it was nice that he was able to kind of make the most of it, right? He scrambled up the middle, uh, kind of got through a, a hit or a couple linemen there where I don't really blame the offensive line. 
on that type of play because screen blocking it's it's literally supposed to be for like one step or a couple of beats, especially on a perimeter screen as opposed to maybe a more traditional running back screen. The perimeter screen, the ball gets out almost immediately. So if they're all thinking that Darnold is going to uh, get rid of the ball, you know, they're kind of going to be a little bit more likely to allow pressure in that kind of scenario. So, you know, I, obviously I don't want to see mishaps like that from Darnold in the future, but outside of that, I thought he did a really good job of keeping the offense on time, right? And I'll go through more specific plays and kind of detail a couple of the more interesting plays that I thought happened, but just know that generally I thought Darnold was making the correct reads, getting the ball where it needed to go. And I mean, that's how you end up 19 to 24 on the day, right? I, I would say maybe he played a little bit more conservatively than we might have expected from Sam Darnold, but I think that's a positive from Darnold as well, right? Where, you know, the, the thing you worry about Sam, from Sam Darnold is not that he lacked the physical talent to make it in the NFL. It's that he always consistently had boneheaded plays and would end up turning the ball over way too frequently. Um, in, in this case, in this game, I, you know, I, he had the one pass I would consider interceptable. It was on a route where he opened to his right. Right. And there, there was a concept over there. He didn't like that. And then he came all the way back to his left and didn't like the concept there before trying to go back to the middle for Addison. I would have thought that he should have read that right to left. Right. So where you have, you know, you, you go to the two routes on the right, then you come back towards the middle. Jordan Addison kind of breaks open, sits down between two linebackers in, in the zone, and he could have found him there more quickly. Because it took him more time to get there, the linebacker was able to undercut the pass, and it got tipped up in the air, and, and fortunately landed incomplete, but it, again, it could have turned into an interception. Um, so that was the one mishap I had from Darnold. I don't really consider it like a a long-term, you know, bozo play kind of making, which is, is something he kind of had the propensity to do you know, previously in his career, it was just, he was a little bit late on the decision. Maybe he, you know, got mixed up on the order of read that he was supposed to go. Maybe he opened to the right. And then all of a sudden was like, I really should have opened the left on that play. So he went there. Right. I, I think it's something that will probably settle down as he gets more settled in this offense. We have to remember that it's, it, it is, you know, his first year in the Kevin O'Connell system, right? I don't think we're going to be a hundred percent perfect, the whole time, and he doesn't have the recent starting experience where it's it's something he can just pop back into, uh, you know, from starting last year. Um, but in mentioning Kevin O'Connell, I, I've probably false started on this a couple times already on this podcast. I did want to go over a couple of the really interesting play designs, and I, I posted most of these to my Twitter. But like, if if you want to try to see a video, but the. The, my fav, my single favorite play design from Kevin O'Connell in this game was on Jalen Naylor's touchdown, right? The Vikings' second touchdown, Jalen Naylor is on a wheel route. He ends up getting wide open. The reason he ended up getting wide open is because Justin Jefferson, the Vikings, had a lineup in the backfield on that play. Um, I, I think Jefferson actually motioned into the backfield, and you can see uh, the Giants' cornerback, Deontay Banks, point very... So he follows Jefferson, and... Uh, the Giants are communicating, particularly with Banks, who's emphatically pointing at Justin Jefferson in the backfield, kind of calling it out, trying to alert the defense that something tricky is going on, right? The Vikings have a trick up their sleeve in this scenario. The trick was not that they were getting the ball to Justin Jefferson, although they've done that a number of times, right? I, I think we see the, the, um, the double passes with Jefferson, where Jefferson's attempting a pass that it, it was kind of a similar setup to that. But so... Jefferson goes from the halfback position, goes back in motion, ends up kind of being a screen to the right. And Darnold, as he's dropping back, pumps on the screen towards Jefferson. This gets Banks, who's following in man coverage to follow him, but it also gets the defender who's supposed to cover Jalen Naylor to trigger on the screen. And he takes a couple false steps forward. Because this is man coverage, that's a death knell for that corner, right? So then as long as there's nobody over the top, Jalen Naylor is going to end up wide open. And um, I, I should have set this up. You had Jordan Addison to the far outside. He was the number one receiver. Jalen Naylor in the slot, right? And then Jefferson's kind of motioning out, swinging out to a screen position from the backfield. Uh, so with that, Jordan Addison's running a post over the top. So that takes the corner above him, who's in man coverage. And it might have been two-man. It might have been uh, single high. I can't remember offhand. But 
whatever it was, Addison's post to occupy the deep safety, right? So there was no possible help from the deep safety, which means the only man who could have covered Naylor was the guy who bit on the screen, right? The, the guy in man coverage on Naylor who bit on the screen. Naylor ends up wide open for the touchdown. It's a beautiful design from Kevin O'Connell, preying on the Giants' uh, propensity to want to cover Justin Jefferson, right? Like, obviously... The number one threat on the Minnesota Vikings offense is Justin Jefferson. Every player on every team has him in the back of his mind, on the in the back of their mind on every play that the Vikings are going to try to do whatever they can to get this guy the football because he's such a dynamic player. And you can play off of that. And I thought the Vikings did that very well in this game. Um, so that's the Neller TD. The Josh Oliver big seam play that was on the first touchdown drive. I believe was also something that kind of played off of Justin Jefferson and also played off of personnel expectations. So this is the red zone. Um, there's a coverage called Red 2. It's it's a red zone version of Tampa 2. It's, it plays out basically the same as Tampa 2, where you have two deep safeties who are kind of wider than a normal cover 2 safety, and then a linebacker in the middle who's, who's kind of the deep hole player who it takes any vertical reps and that kind of makes up for the extra width of the safeties back there. Um, so it, in that coverage... You know, well, first of all, a, a good way to attack Tampa 2 or cover 3 in general is cover 4. The Vikings ran cover 4 on this play. But the way they got to it, I thought was pretty interesting. To the left side of the screen, they had, I, I assume it was Jordan Addison, and I didn't actually note the outside receiver, but Jordan Addison, let's say, outside, and then Justin Jefferson in the slot. Then they were actually in 21 personnel. So to the bottom of the screen, they just had uh, a nub tight end in Josh Oliver before they motioned out C.J. Ham to be the wide receiver. So on one side, you have two wide receivers, and on the other side, you have a tight end who's really the Vikings' primary blocking tight end, right? He's not even a great receiver with T.J. Hawkinson out. And you have C.J. Ham, the fullback, right? So that combination, you're going to alert to the side with the two wide receivers, right? The Vikings run four verticals. Everybody's running a vertical route. The high hole player, right, the Tampa player, turns full on to his right to to check Justin Jefferson, who's running up the seam, right? And he's focused on Jeff Justin Jefferson and running up the seam. This means that it's an absolutely wide open throw for Sam Darnold to hit Josh Oliver up the seam. I uh, really like the design, really like the detail of putting Oliver and Ham on the same side, but still attacking vertically. With them, I, I think that kind of lulled the defense into a false sense of security, right? We're not going to send our blocking tight end and our fullback deep and expect to complete a deep pass, except we did. Um, so another really cool play design for McConnell there. And then, um, you know, uh, maybe not so much play design, but an overall philosophy thing, I thought, was how the Giants really kind of over-focused on Justin Jefferson in this game, right? And it it ended up being a relatively meager stat line for Justin Jefferson, right? Uh, four catches, I think, 50-plus yards. He did lead the Vikings in targets. He had six targets. It's still a 25% target share, right? So it's not like peak Justin Jefferson is probably like a 30% target share, but it's not like it's low. It's just the Vikings didn't really throw the ball as much, so we didn't get a ton of production from him. But um, I, I think that was really primarily because the uh, Giants were really focused on him. And the Jordan Addison defensive pass interference call that we got that really extended the drive on third down um, was due to the focus on Justin Jefferson. So Justin Jefferson is in the outside and the or he motions to become the outside of the receiver on the same side that Addison is that puts Addison in the slot, right? He was originally the number one. He becomes the new number two after the Jefferson motion. And uh, uh, the Giants kick out the coverage. So the slot defender, you know, they want the outside corner on Justin Jefferson. So now the slot defender has to be on Jordan Addison. But the deep safety also over the top also lean toward Jefferson on the play. They basically high load Jefferson on this play in a cover two sort of variation. But what that did was got Jordan Addison one-on-one -on -one with a slot player who he beat deep. Um, 
And really, you know, I, I think if Sam Darnold was able to lay that throw out further, it could have maybe even been a touchdown, right, as opposed to a defensive pass or interference. As it was, the pressure got to Darnold a little bit, and he wasn't able to fully step into the throw. I think even on the follow-through, like, his hand hit the defender's arm or something like that. So it's a little bit of a, a scary situation, right? You don't want to ever see your quarterback hand on a follow through hit a defender's arm because that can mean broken fingers um which obviously puts the quarterback out for you know however many weeks until it takes for the fingers on your throwing hand to heal right um but addison you know beats the player soundly the safety over the top wasn't able to get there to help and because darnold underthrows the ball addison's able to fight back through it and draw the dpi right on it to some extent you got bailed out by an underthrown uh defensive pass interference, but by the same token, Jordan Addison had the corner beat regardless, so I don't really feel too guilty about, you know, benefiting from really kind of an underthrow situation there. Um, so, you know, that that's another play, and then the final play I wanted to highlight in terms of Kevin O'Connell's play design was actually not even a completion, it was the second deep ball to Justin Jefferson that actually ended up getting broken up, and I I thought it was a really good play by the Giants corner, and I'll kind of explain why. So I I believe it was a third down situation, and the Vikings are in a bunch formation to the left, right? So you have, um, I think it was, it it was Jefferson is the point man in the bunch, and then uh, Munt was on the inside, I think, and then Brandon Powell was on the outside of that. So in bunch as a defense, there are a couple ways you can play it. And the Giants chose to lock and level it. Lock and level basically play, means you're going to play man coverage out of the bunch. You lock onto your man and you stay at different levels. So if you watch the play, um, you can see that the guy covering Jefferson is up in press coverage on him. The guy on the inside covering the tight end is a little bit back. And then the guy on the outside covering Brandon Powell in man coverage on Brandon Powell is the furthest back. Um, so that's kind of lock and level, right? You have all the defensive backs on different levels and they're locked in man coverage. Well, there were a couple things. The Vikings might have motioned into the bunch in the first place, but they definitely motioned with the bunch, a kind of a quick motion by Johnny Munt from the inside of the bunch all the way to the outside. So now instead of a bunch, you kind of have three receivers in close proximity to each other. The Giants defense responded to this by having the defensive back, I believe it was 27, Jason Pinnock. He followed uh, Munt, but then he pushed out. So he followed Munt and then switched with the outside receiver who was on Brandon Powell. Okay, so you can see by the fact that Pinnock followed, he was in man coverage because otherwise you would box a bunch, which basically means the person on the inside takes the first inside receiver, the person on the outside takes the first outside receiver, and then the guy in the middle is either uh, <laughs> takes what the third guy does, essentially. But um, So if you were shifting that, you might need to move laterally a little bit when, when the Vikings you know, kind of made that motion, but you wouldn't actually follow the guy. So it's pretty clearly man coverage here. Um, and the Vikings have a really good beater for man coverage in this instance because they're actually running a pick with Brandon Powell. So Jefferson's on the far inside with a man in press coverage on him and Powell's to his outside shoulder. Powell, they, they run a switch release essentially with Powell and Jefferson, but Powell goes right into the shoulder of the guy covering Jefferson, right? He kind of almost blocks him. Like it, it really is a pick. Might be uh, offensive pass interference ultimately, but Powell sells it well enough that he doesn't get the flag thrown, right? And that leaves Justin Jefferson wide open. I mean, he has a ton of space on a wheel route available to him. The thing is, Jason Pinnock, 27, recognizes this pick and goes for the switch immediately and chases down Jefferson on the backside. So he was the guy who was able to contest the pass and force it to end up incomplete because he made a really, really good read on the coverage. He was in man coverage on Brandon Powell, but he was smart enough to switch over and get to Justin Jefferson and make the stop, right? I still think it's a fantastic design against that bunch formation. Just a really nice play by the defender. So I I wanted to highlight all of those as Kevin O'Connell play designs that I thought were really interesting throughout the course of the game. And, you know, he's a high-level pass game designer. Like, like I think that the pass game works really well together. Um, 
Actually, I have one last thing I just thought of with O'Connell. Um, the Vikings had a number of plays where they got running backs out quick to the flat, and they were the first read. They clearly didn't respect the Giants linebackers' ability and their speed to get to the flat in this game, which is something you can do if you uh, you know don't respect your opposing linebackers, right? And it worked to great success. Aaron Jones had a first down on this. Ty Chandler, I think, had a couple first downs on it. Um, you know, it, it was just cool to see as a quick way to get free yardage, right? There are other free access things that you can do. Like if they're playing 10 yards off Justin Jefferson, you can just throw in the ball. But this is kind of a free access, free yardage, early down, keep the chains moving kind of deal um, that Kevin O'Connell implemented, and I, I like to see it. Um, so if we flip over back to original to the individual players, right, Justin Jefferson, I mentioned that, you know, his target share I honestly thought was was pretty reasonable, for what he was, especially with how heavily um, the Giants were focusing on covering him. I brought that up uh, with, with kind of the Addison play, right? Um, but, you know, man, I, the connection between Darnold and Jefferson on that 44-yard deep ball, absolutely beautiful, right? Like, Darnold just completely drops in the bucket. Jefferson gets wide open. The touchdown, the slant touchdown from Darnold to Jefferson, also incredible, right? So the Giants on that play were clearly manned up on the backside, one-on-one Deontay Bakes versus Justin Jefferson. If you're the Vikings, you take Justin Jefferson one-on-one versus any corner in the NFL. In that scenario, is fourth down. Um, he has got a two-way go, so he runs the slant, you know, wins, survives the catch through contact with his back. That's what makes him so good is the ability to win one-on-one in basically any scenario, in a difficult scenario. Uh, Banks knows it's probably either going to be a fade or a slant and leans towards the slant because he's got inside access and, and Banks has no help inside. And Jefferson still wins against an okay corner. I'm not going to call Banks like one of the top corners in the NFL, but I think he's a, a solid NFL player. Um, you know, he, he Jefferson is just somebody you can trust on every single play. So uh, I love to see that. Um, you know, uh, flipping it over to Jordan Addison, who obviously has an ankle injury. It sounds like he did not practice today. That's probably a concern for his availability this week after he went out of the game. I, I figured it was probably unlikely that he would end up playing against the 49ers, uh, especially because of the previous ankle injury, although I guess that was the different ankle, right? Um, but, you know, the thing is, because the Vikings only threw the ball 24 times, a lot of guys, and, and Sam Darnold spread the ball out really well. I think like eight, eight different guys got a reception, right? Eight different guys getting a reception is literally a third of your 24 targets, right? So guys aren't getting repeat targets all that often. Um, and Addison didn't get a ton of hard targets, but I thought, you know, he showed really great route running on two that he did on that 99-yard touchdown drive. Um where And it was on consecutive plays. Um, he was able to win to the out route two plays in a row. I thought he sold the route really well. He had – so on an out route, what you want to do is stem inside a little bit. So you, you end up going straight vertical, and then you lean towards the inside – before you have to break down in two or three steps and turn very quickly to the outside. The inside lean gets the cornerback to have to take a step and turn his uh, hips towards the inside in case you're running a post. And then you, you know, get him turned the wrong direction and basically are able to run outside of that. Um, on those plays, I thought Sam Darnold had some pretty good anticipation. Like it was, it wasn't true. Like he was throwing the ball well before, like before Addison even broke down and the, the ball hit him as soon as he turned around. But on the first play in particular, I thought that Darnold was able to get the ball and get into his throwing motion while Addison was making the break as opposed to after seeing him turn and get open. Right. And that timing is very important for an offense that's timing based, which the Vikings is in, in terms of how you're doing your pass concepts, right? There's only a short window of opportunities. And I kind of talked about this earlier with the Darnold pass that got batted up in the air, right? And it was almost an interception. There's only a short window of opportunity for open receivers on a, on a route play, even if they win pretty heavily, right? So you have to make sure you're getting the ball to them on time. And Darnold did a good job of that to Addison on both of those plays. So, Definitely a loss with Addison. I, I'd like to see Tristan Jackson get in the game a little bit. I'd like to see, you know, obviously a lot more from Jalen Naylor next week if, if he has to go into that role 
Uh, he really only had the touchdown in this game, which, you know, I, as I kind of detailed earlier, all he had to do was was run to the end zone, right? There wasn't really much route running he had to do on that play because the design is what sprung him open and, and kind of fooled the defensive back. Um, if we flip it over to the run game, I was absolutely astounded by what the Vikings got from Aaron Jones. I wrote an article over at zonecoverage.com, uh, kind of go over what I thought of Jones's game, but he just looks so much better than either of the two backs the Vikings had last year in uh, Alex Madison and Ty Chandler. And Ty Chandler, to me, had a little bit of a rough game in this one. Obviously, he ended up with eight carries for 17 yards. I thought he still wasn't seeing the field as well as I need him, too, to be a consistent back. Like, I, I thought he left yards on the field in opportunities where he could have cut sooner and kind of found extra yardage. But going back to Jones, obviously had uh, 94 yards on 14 carries, had a touchdown. You know, the Vikings' first touchdown of the season was a run by Aaron Jones. And that run was was great to me because it was like vintage Dalvin Cook almost, where it was a duo run, up, uh, you know, which is a kind of an – Inside run, it's it's a popular run in the red zone because you're just kind of running straight forward at the defense with the option for the running back to bounce it if the corners get too tight and if the defense is too tight inside, you can try to take it to the corner. And Jones takes it to the corner here with a corner in pretty good position to stop that, honestly. Um, I didn't think the block from, I think it was Brandon Powell, on the outside blocking in this case. I thought the block was okay from Brandon Powell, but the corner is clearly maintained because he knocked the corner back like a yard or two, but the corner is clearly maintaining outside leverage on him. And Jones sees this and just beats him to the corner, right? He went untouched kind of to the pylon, even though the corner was chasing him from the outside. So that kind of burst and speed and decisiveness from Jones, because he takes the handoff and basically runs straight outside. I think that helped him quite a bit in terms of his acceleration on the play and uh, prevented the corner from kind of, even being able to make that play or any of the linebackers from being able to get over um, was really impressive to me. Uh, you know, I, I don't think he was maybe the highest top end speed guy in the NFL. Like, I don't think he ran great at the combine, but like his short area quickness was absolutely incredible in this game. And really it doesn't seem like he slowed down a bit, but just despite being a 29 year old running back, right. Um, I thought his vision was phenomenal. There was a play on inside zone that the Vikings ran where he jumped over two gaps to find a hole in nine yards where, you know, an Alex Madison in the world who I, who I thought made good decisions, but would have kind of run up in behind it and grinded it for three or four yards, right? Jones is able to have the creativity while still making a smart decision, right? So there's a, for me, there's a difference between, you know, a jumping something and knowing it's going to work out then kind of cutting outside without a plan and you end up losing yardage or you end up not able to uh, really make anything positive out of it when you could have followed the straightforward track and gotten a couple yards and it wouldn't have been a, an explosive game, but it would have been okay, right? So like Ty Chandler does more of the, you know, jumping outside without a plan and not following the path in front of him. Uh, Alex Madison followed the path in front of him but wasn't able to get anything more than what was blocked for him. Uh, Aaron Jones is able to kind of color outside the lines a little bit and make it work. So I, that was something that I thought was really impressive from him in this game. Also just his ability with short area quickness. I mean, even at the end of the game, like he was dancing all around the place, finding three or four extra yards when nothing was there. And it was like the end of the fourth quarter of a game that the Vikings had solidly in hand. It's like, dude, don't get yourself hurt. But also I love the effort that's coming from Jones in this game. Um, you know, he's, he's basically impossible to tackle one-on-one -on -one in space. Uh, there was, there was a play on a, on a power run where he found a crease. I didn't even like, I, I couldn't even see was there. Really, there was no space in between the two. And, and granted, it was the backs of blockers, but in between the two blockers that he was running through, he broke kind of a, a decent wrap attempt. It, it was an arm tackle, but it had some weight, and then he broke another ankle tackle, right? So this guy's breaking tackles left and right. He's making great decisions. He's kind of maximizing runs. He's lowering his shoulder to finish runs. I thought uh, Aaron Jones was a phenomenal uh, addition to the Vikings, and I, I'm really looking forward to seeing him for the rest of the year. 
Um, the other thing I was impressed with by the Vikings run game was the variety that Kevin O'Connell was able to call, right? So we had 15 zone runs and, and 10 gap runs by my count. Um, you know, it was a lot of outside zone. It was a lot of inside zone on offense. Those were still probably the two primary runs. But they also ran a lot of duo, um, particularly in red zone and short yardage. I thought, uh, and, and that was pretty effective. Obviously, we got the Jones touchdown on it. There was one play where the Vikings offensive line just absolutely blocked a duo run perfectly, and Jones got 10 yards into the secondary. Um, I, I thought the Giants really didn't do a great job on the defensive side of the ball. I, I thought their linebackers were pretty atrocious. They were kind of overrunning things a lot. They were treating a lot of things like it was outside zone, and they would end up getting fooled and, and completely blocking themselves out of the play. So that did help create some yardage for Jones, but still, I, overall, I, I thought it was a strong performance from him. Um, and like I said, good variety from the Vikings coaching staff in terms of the play calling, and good blocking, I, I think, along the offensive line. I, I really didn't have complaints in run blocking about any individual offensive linemen. Um that, that were consistent issues. I thought all of them got good movement. You had great combos from like Darisaw, uh, Darisaw and Brandell and Bradbury and Ingram had a couple of great combos climbing to the second level. Um, that duo play I mentioned was one of them. There were a couple outside zones where they just completely demolished the defensive tackles. And, and it was honestly a lot of backups for the Giants probably on those runs, but there, there were a couple of plays with Dexter Lawrence in there. Uh, you know, I they didn't do as good on the outside zone runs getting to, like, the linebackers at the second level. Like, Bradbury got a holding call because he was a little bit late to get to the linebacker, kind of grabbed the front of his jersey a little bit. I thought it was a little bit ticky-tack on the holding, but, you know, kind of is what it is. Um, I I was really impressed, though, just, just overall with the run blocking of the offensive line. And that includes Blake Randell, but is is not exclusive to Blake Brandell, right? I thought all five guys had pretty strong games run blocking. Um, The tight ends did a little bit worse, I would say. You know, there were notable misses from Oliver and Munt. Munt on a pin and pull at the goal line for Ty Chandler ended up losing three yards because he couldn't get out and block the corner in front of him and Chandler couldn't break that tackle. Um, But at, at the end of the day, like, especially Oliver was has to, with some really difficult assignments on the one that he lost. So it's it's kind of like not really that big of an issue long term for me. I think the Vikings are going to have a strong run game and a much stronger run game than they have in the past two years under Kevin O'Connell. Um, if you flip it over to the pass protection, that's where, you know, Ed Ingram and Garrett Bradbury really had a rough day. And they had a rough day with specifically one player, Dexter Lawrence, right? I think PFF credited him with six pressures. He was consistently pushing the pocket. Uh, the first sack of the game, the only sack, you know, the sack on the first drive, the only sack that Sam Darnold took was a rep where the Giants got the Vikings to kind of go five on five with the offensive line, slide Bradbury to the left where the Giants threatened with five guys on the line of scrimmage. That left Ed Ingram one on one with Dexter Lawrence, and he just lost. Right. I, I think there are going to be some scenarios in the NFL where, hey, you're going up against the single best nose tackle in the NFL in Dexter Lawrence. Like, I don't think it's a question that he's the best nose tackle, and he's like a top three interior defensive lineman, period, right? So you're going to be overmatched in some situations. you got to find ways to block him with two guys. And even when he was blocked with two guys, you know, he was splitting kind of double teams from Ingram and Radbury, trying to find any way to get to the quarterback, and he, and he had a great impact on the quarterback. I think he was the one hopefully I'm remembering this correctly, that hit Sam Darnold's arm on the interception that flew up in the air, right? So at at the end of the day, the Vikings did not do a good job of containing um, Dexter Lawrence, but they did do a good job elsewhere. And like Blake Brandell, I don't think allowed any pressures, but I don't think he really had many reps against Dexter Lawrence, right? He was going against kind of the lower level defensive tackles. It was really, they kept Lawrence over to the side of Ingram and Bradbury. Um, So... End of the day, you know, pass protection, interior rough day for Ingram and Bradbury. They're not going to be facing Dexter Lawrence every game. I think they can do a better job moving forward. Like, uh, we kind of know what they are as Vikings fans at this point, right? Like, Bradbury's a $5 million a year center. That obviously indicates that he's not one of the best centers in the league, but I think he's more than serviceable. And I think 
his ability for to make protection calls for this offense has value. It's just the Vikings aren't investing the highest level that they could in the center position or frankly, in the right guard position, right? Because if they had wanted to go out and find a replacement for Ed Ingram on the open market, they could have done that this past year, but they chose not to in order for him to continue to develop. Um, on the flip side, you know, I, I and again, I don't think Bradbury and Ingram were, were terrible in this game. I thought they were very good at run blocking. I think, you know, pass protection is going to be a concern against the Dexter Lawrences of the world. But the Vikings made it work on offense. Like, they were still clearly a very efficient offense, even with those pressures that Dexter Lawrence was getting. So, I, I, I don't think it's a killer for the Vikings offense, to be honest with you. Um, and on the other hand, Christian Derisaw was absolutely dominant in this football game. He was going up against Kayvon Thibodeau most of the time, although he did have a couple reps against Brian Burns. Brian Burns, by the way, I thought was relatively shut out. He did have a win against uh, Brian O'Neill. To me, but but otherwise, I thought Brian O'Neill played a pretty good game as well. Uh, but Darisol was just absolutely dominant. He dirted Kayvon Thibodeau multiple times. Uh, the one time it got called for holding that I don't agree with at all. I thought it was a pretty bogus holding call. Um, he just put him on an island, locked him down, and and made him not an impact in the football game. Uh, I, w- I would say he, I, I should say, I think he allowed one pressure on a stump, but really the ball was out and it was a stunt. That was the pressure, right? Brandell got knocked back a little bit. Derisaw couldn't quite get back to the inside. And, you know, it was a little bit later in the down that the pressure happened. So the, it might have even been charted on Sam Darnold for holding onto the ball for a little bit. Um, absolutely love what I saw of Derisaw out of this game, though. So with that, I'm going to flip it over to the defensive side of the ball, who I absolutely loved all game, too. I mean, they flew to the football. You could see from play number one that the Vikings defense was playing with their hair on fire. Um, I put out a highlight on Twitter that had almost everybody on, you know, the back seven of the defense flying the ball, like Blake Cashman, Ivan Pace, uh, Byron Murphy and Cam Bynum, and Josh Metellus, and Stephon Gilmore even had plays where they were, like, trying to blow up screens, blowing up run plays in the background, in, in the backfield, like it was happening in every single scenario. Uh, Harrison Smith obviously had the interception that he drove on, you know, a, a lot of good stuff there. Um, but one player I wanted to shout out and, you know, if, if you've listened to this podcast for a while, you know, we have a little bit of lo- a love affair with Harrison Phillips, who I, I think is really underrated for what his skill set brings on the interior of the Vikings, right? Like he is a run defender first. He's never going to give you too much as a pass rush, but the run defense is critical on base downs and the Vikings try to find their pass rush elsewhere, as I'll get into a little bit on later downs in in passing scenarios, right? And he also appears to be a, a leader on the defensive line, right? He's in charge of the defensive line calls in terms of stunts and things like that. So I think he's absolutely worth the two year, $19 million extension that the Vikings gave him. Uh, just a couple days ago, really, you know, you could see it from the first play of this game that he's locked in and ready to play the season. He does a great job kind of reading the run in front of him. So he's getting down blocked from the guard to his right. He's actually head up on the center in a zero tech nose position, sees the center go to his right, sees the pulling guard that was going from his right to his left and is able to turn, take on the right guard who ends up blocking him shed that right guard and get it on the tackle that Blake Cashman also rushed forward to. Um, he also got a sack in this game. It was kind of a cleanup sack, but we absolutely take those. And he got a pass breakup on a stun. Like he was kind of affecting the game in all sorts of areas in the box score, along with his traditional very strong run defense. So really impressed with Harrison Phillips. Huge shout out to him for, for getting the big deal. Um, you know, uh, the, the story of the game, to me, I guess, on the defensive side of the ball for the Vikings was just how inept they made the pass offense for the Giants, right? Like, it, it was going absolutely nowhere outside of a couple nice plays to Malik Neighbors, who looked really good. Like, he looked the part as a guy who's, you know, a top, I guess he was a six overall pick, but like a top five pick, you know, um, or maybe it was seventh overall. I don't know. Guys kind of fell. Um, in the draft, but um, no, it, it, I'm sorry, I'm wasting time here, but it was sixth overall in the draft. Um, Daniel Jones seemed to have no appetite 
for trying to discern what the Vikings were doing on the back end in terms of coverage. Um, I went through and charted what the Vikings did in terms of coverage. They played 51 coverage snaps. That includes plays where uh, the there was a scramble or a sack or a couple plays got you know nullified due to penalty. But they only played 10 man coverage reps with 41 zone coverage reps. Um, you know, I... I, I think that's actually more man than the rate that the Vikings played man last year because they played almost no man at all. Um, but I, I think generally on the back end, you saw very much uh, it, it kind of was similar to last year in that the Vikings are running, you know, staples uh, of their defense like Tampa 2 and cover 3. And they actually ran a lot of quarters in this game as well, I would say, more so than they were running last year. But Tampa 2, cover 3, and quarters – were kind of the coverage staples that they ran in this game, but they're getting into it from all sorts of funky ways, um, particularly cover three and the Tampa two, right? They do all the weird invert stuff. There was one play where I, it took me a while to try to figure out what they were doing on this, but it's basically uh, Harrison Smith and Josh Metellus were in the on the line of scrimmage, and Harrison Smith runs back to play the deep middle of the field with Cam Bynum originally in the deep middle of the field, right? So you've got corners on either end, and then Cam Bynum looks like he's in the deep middle, but he actually comes up and is, um, you know, an underneath zone in cover three. Uh, and Josh Metellus is sprinting out with Harrison Smith because he's relating to the number three receiver on the other side, and he's got a cover three zone underneath as well. Um, it's, it's three buzz is what the name of the coverage is. Uh, three buzz Mabel specifically from like a save and perspective where the Mike player, which was, um, Josh Metellus in this case is relating to the number three. The thing was Josh Metellus, rather than being, you know, a middle linebacker, right? Like the traditional Mike position was on the line of scrimmage opposite where the where the uh, three receiver set was, so he's running all the way back to the middle to try to relate to this player um, on a vertical route. So it looked like you know he was kind of chasing Harrison Smith up the field, but that's what was going on there. Um, so really funky way to get to that coverage. Probably hard from an offensive perspective to discern. And Daniel Jones didn't look interested in doing that. Like he was just checking down time after time after time. The Giants offense was inept. They either weren't in the right position or Daniel Jones wasn't able to throw the ball accurately or they were dropping the passes that he was throwing. So it it looked really bad all throughout the course of the game. Um, And the Vikings funky coverages, I think are a big part of that. Um, You flip it over to, you know, another Probably the single standout of the game for the Vikings on defense, right, was Andrew Van Ginkle. He also, unfortunately, had a foot injury so and was um, DNP for Vikings practice today. So we'll have to monitor his status throughout the week. Um, but Van Ginkle had a sack, you know, uh, in the red zone uh, that forced the... Um, Forced the Giants' first field goal. That was pretty much a cleanup sack to me. It wasn't all that interesting. But the great play was his interception, right? So on the interception, the Giants have four receivers to the right of the offense. The Vikings on that play kind of baited the screen, uh, if you're asking me. I, I think everybody on the Vikings' defense knew the Giants were going to try to throw a screen in that scenario because the Vikings only had three players over the four uh, eligible receivers for the Giants, right? So uh, screens are kind of – quick screens are kind of a numbers game where you want to have as many uh, eligible receivers as you do players on the defense to that side, Right. So when the Giants have four uh, compared to three Vikings defenders, they're actually plus one in that scenario. So they've got a blocker for every single Vikings defender on that screen, which is like a huge, massive win. Like they're thinking, hey, we're probably going to bust this for a touchdown because everybody on the Vikings is up on the line of scrimmage looking like they're going to blitz. The Vikings know this, so they're baiting this. Ivan Pace runs way out, runs out to the screen immediately at the snap because he knows that's his coverage responsibility and he's got to get there to stop the screen from being a big gain. Andrew Van Ginkle, who's rushing to that side, 
knows that a quick throw is coming because the Giants can't block up everybody the Vikings have on the line of scrimmage. So a quick throw has to get out, right? If if you can't block everybody up, there's going to be an unblocked player. you got got to get rid of the ball quickly. So he's reading pass all the way, makes a great catch, right? Like I can't imagine how difficult it is to catch a – you know, a, a ball that's thrown very hard to a player on the screen who's where you're like a third of the way there, right? So, so the ball is intended to be thrown like at least 10 yards away. You're about three yards away from Daniel Jones and you got to make an adjustment to make that catch. It's like if you were pitching, you know, it, it like imagine trying to hit a 90 mile an hour fastball that, but the pitcher's mound is like, half the distance that it normally is, right? Like, it, it seems like an absolutely impossible task to catch that ball, but he does and ends up running it back into the end zone very easily for a pick six. Great play. Love to see the usage from Van Ginkle, who was in coverage quite a bit, and I thought, you know, matched up to coverage really well in this game. Um, you know, had the sack. I, I don't think he was too dominant or anything as a pass rusher. Uh, I thought Grenard was probably the best individual pass rusher from the Vikings on the day. But, you know, still, still a very nice play from uh, Van Ginkel. Uh, great to see, you know, one of the two of the additions I've talked about so far, right? Sam Darnold, free agent edition. Andrew Van Ginkel, free agent edition. Probably stole the show on both sides of the ball. Um, I talked a little bit about in the episode I put out uh, on Saturday, that one of the keys to the games for the Viking was going to be containing the rush from Daniel Jones, right? The scramble from Daniel Jones. And I thought the Vikings did a phenomenal job of, of that. Um, Daniel Jones rushing stats on the day were something like uh, pulling it up five attempts for 20 yards. I mean, that's basically nothing. He did have a third and seven conversion on a scramble, but he also got sacked five times by the Vikings, right? And there weren't really any clean wins. Oh, we sacked Daniel Jones immediately. Um, it was mostly he was trying to move up into the pocket, right? That was the Harrison Smith smack. That was the Andrew Van Ginkel sack. That was a little bit the Dallas Turner sack. And there was kind of one uh, Pat Jones sack where he kind of ran into that as well, right? So he's just kind of running into, you know, he's trying to find green grass and the Vikings are filling that in with their contain plan. So I thought that was a really nice contain plan by the Vikings against a mobile quarterback who kind of you need to have that plan solidified against. Um, there, there was one other play I wanted to highlight in, in terms of the sack that the Vikings made, and that was Pat Jones getting an unblocked sack basically on Daniel Jones. He actually missed him the first time and then came back and finished the sack. Right, This was Pat Jones' first sack on the day. On that play, the Vikings are running their Hawk Blitz, right? That's where you have everybody up on the line of scrimmage. It's cover zero on the back end, so you've got a, a corner kind of playing off coverage against all the receivers across the board there. The Vikings play, the way the Vikings play to please out a little bit more like zone coverage, you have what's called a tag pressure from a couple play players on the defensive line where they go up, tag the lineman in front of them, and then drop back into coverage. Um, that tag was critical on this play because the Giants can see pre-snap that they can't block everybody that the Vikings are sending, right? So they have to slide one direction. They decide to slide towards Andrew Van Ginkle instead of slide, sliding towards Patrick Jones. Because they slide towards Van Ginkle, Van Ginkle drops back into coverage. Ivan Pace also drops back into coverage. That's important because jo Daniel Jones knows that if Pat Jones is coming, which he sees and knows it's an unblocked pressure, he has to get to his hot route. His hot route was an over-the-ball route by the running back. If you have seen Minnesota Vikings tape or you understand how these tag pressures operate, you know that you can't run an over-the-ball route as a hot route against the Vikings because they will have players drop into coverage who are there to intercept that ball. And that was Andrew Van Ginkle and Ivan Pace in this case. So Jones sees the over-the-ball route completely covered, freezes, tries to look to his left, and ends up getting, you know, hit by Patrick Jones. He stays up somehow, and then Jones eventually corrals him for the sack. Um, so, you know, I, I don't, I can't say I put that fully on Daniel Jones, although, you know, if you're the Giants, you would hope that you've prepared for what your opponent's going to do and kind of, you know, the Vikings have a counter to the counter to their blitz, right? So you have to think that step ahead, and I don't think the Giants were prepared to do that in this scenario. Um, 
you know, uh, a couple other guys to shout out. Jerry Tillery, I thought, had a nice day. Uh, he forced a holding on a pass rush where he just won completely against the center, and, and the guard actually had the wherewithal to hold him. Uh, there were a couple other nice rushes from him. Nothing spectacular, but, like, he did add interior juice, which is something the Vikings had a major need for, so it was nice to see that. Um, Jihad Ward, I thought, also had a pretty nice game. Uh, you know, it was kind of interesting to see the change for the Vikings with the new defensive personnel in that they put four outside linebackers. Let's call it, they're, they're all edge rushers, right? I should just call them edge rushers. Um, in the two-minute drill situation for the Giants at the end of the half, they had zero interior defensive linemen on the field and they had four edge rushers it was grenard it was van ginkle it was turner it was jihad ward right and it was grenard and ward who were rushing on the inside against the guards jihad ward was destroying these guards he had a couple nice spin moves to get pressures there were the dallas turner sack was on a stunt where ward did a really nice job of grabbing kind of in the chest plate of the tackle something that will never get called for holding and springing turner free right preventing the tackle from getting over and following turner who got right into jones's face and ended up sacking him um he, I think he crashed another stunt. Well, that led to a pressure as well. Like, he just, I thought, had a really good sequence of events there. I think he is a interesting piece as an interior rusher on passing downs, which is not something I was expecting to say before we started that, before this game. But I, I think he has a little something there, right? I, he's never going to be a high-level edge rusher to me, but I, I think as an edge rusher who you can move inside and beat opponents with, you know, having more quickness to, than guards, it, it's kind of an interesting idea. And it's cool to see that the Vikings have, like, Grenard was clearly the Vikings' best edge rusher in this game. Dallas Turner had a strong game with the, you know, all the ability in the world, and Van Ginkle is such a versatile piece. And now we have this fourth guy, and even Patrick Jones, right, got two sacks on the game. Um, so we have so much depth in that rotation that it's really nice to see. Um I mentioned Jonathan Grenard a couple times. Like I said, I thought he was the Vikings' best individual pass rusher. Uh, there was a nice win against the right tackle, Jermaine Illuminor, for a sack. I'm trying to remember what else offhand, but it, but he had I you know a few pressures in this game. So I thought he showed really well as a pass rusher for the Vikings in his first game, even if he didn't really hit the stat sheet up all that much with the sack or anything like that. Um, you know, Harrison Smith obviously got a red zone interception. To break that down a little bit, the Vikings in this case were playing, uh, I, I mentioned Tampa 2 on the uh, in the red zone right, red 2. The Vikings were playing that in this case. Uh, Harrison Smith sees a slant or a post coming from the receiver. He jumps that post. Uh, Daniel Jones tried to fit the ball behind the receiver a little bit because he saw Mantellus covering the middle of the field. Harrison Smith's right there. He gets the interception. Uh, really nice play by him. Uh, Josh Mantellus also had another phenomenal pass breakup that was earlier in the game. Um, and actually, it was on a similar route for, for Malik Neighbors' first 25-yard reception where he ended up getting wide open. I thought Mantellus was a little bit responsible on that play. But a couple plays before, he had seen a... Very similar combination where he's dropping back from the line of scrimmage. He knows there was no route from the Giants to the left-hand side of the screen. They kept the tight end, who's the only eligible receiver on that side, into block. So he starts moving over to his right, right, where you had three eligible receivers to the right. Quickly is watching Daniel Jones' eyes, sees the throw, and is able to undercut it and bat the pass down. Like, I thought it was a phenomenal high IQ football play. There was another high IQ play where Metellus, um, I believe it was cover three, and he was responsible for the flat, but he anticipated what Jones was going to do and peeled off the flat defender to a tight end who was trying to settle in between the two zones and got his body around there. Um, you know, Joan, Daniel Jones and the tight end weren't on the same page, so the throw was a little bit behind the tight end and it was incomplete regardless. But he would have delivered a solid hit and maybe broken the pass up if the throw had been directly to the tight end. So I thought Metellus, you know, kind of picked up where he left off with some incredibly high IQ plays. He was chasing after screen plays. You know, I, I think it was, it was pretty nice. Um, 
And then finally, I just wanted to shout out, there wasn't a lot of action on the Vikings outside corners. Like Byron Murphy, a lot of couple receptions. I didn't think he had too bad of a game, but he did get beat pretty bad on, on the one route that he allowed. Um, it, it was a comeback route. It was in the red zone. But then he probably forced a fumble on that play. Like the ball went out of bounds, so it didn't really matter anyway. But he forced a fumble or broke the pass up after the fact. Um, but it, I, I don't know. The official blew it dead. The Vikings didn't challenge. So it, it ended up counting as a completion and no fumble or anything. And it actually went for a first down. So he got run off a little bit on that play, but I, I thought it was great recovery. I thought he played really quickly to attack kind of, you know, uh, underneath stuff. Um, Malik Neighbors caught a slant on him where I thought he was in pretty strong coverage. He later broke up a slant on fourth down, right? Like, I, I didn't think he had a bad game by any stretch, but, you know, there were, there were a couple mishaps, I would say, on his part. The players I didn't think had mishap. well, okay, I say that. Uh, Shaq Griffin had a... Um, Defensive pass interference, but that was really the only notable target for him or Stephon Gilmore in the game, right? They kind of they kind of blanked uh, what happened to them, or you know, if they were targeted, it was throws to the flat where the the Vikings rallied and tackled or, or things like that, right? So it was really nice to see for me to see um, Shaq Griffin and Stephon Gilmore, Shaq Griffin and Stephon Gilmore be like adults. In the room at corner, I don't think that's really the something the Vikings had outside of Byron Murphy last year. Like, just I, I don't think a Caleb Evans or Makai Blackman or anybody else who got in for the Vikings really had the veteran savvy that those guys do to be able to play coverage the way you need to in zone, prevent throws underneath, take away throwing windows that. Um, you know, kind of discouraged throws from the quarterback. And then uh, Stephon Gilmore, even on a screen, worked very hard to blow it up, right? You have a guy who's 35 years old who signed late into training camp, probably didn't want to add the wear and tear to his body, play really hard in this game. Like, I I thought he played physical and hard. So it was was really good to see that, you know, a a guy who seems to be, like, fully bought in from from his perspective. Um, So, yeah, really... Again, they weren't challenged majorly, you know. There may have been an instance or two where they allowed some separation, but the throw didn't get there, so so overall it'll be a good game. Now, it'll be interesting to monitor against better opponents than the Giants, right? The Giants only had one notable receiver, Malik Neighbors. They really had no pass-catching threats outside of that, and they had a quarterback who was running for his life in the backfield and really didn't seem all that, uh, you know, mentally prepared to play a defense that throws a bunch of crazy coverages at you. So you get some of these better prepared teams and the Vikings are going to play one this next week and it it might be a different story, but it'll be something that we have to monitor. Um, So that was really a long breakdown on Vikings giants. Um, You know, hopefully a lot of detail that you guys could take away some stuff from, but I'm going to flip it over to the 49ers game here. Um, So first thing about the 49ers is, you know, Christian McCaffrey probably looks unlikely to play. Like, the the 49ers aren't saying anything, but they're talking, hey, maybe it's a good idea to put him on IR right now. So I I really don't think he's going to play in the game against the Vikings, right? But if you look at their roster, it's it's all the same stars that took them to the Super Bowl last year, almost across the board, right? I mean, Trent Williams, who we didn't actually have to play last year, Debo Samuel, who we didn't have to play last year, Um, you know, Brandon Ayuk, Brock Purdy, uh, the rest of that offensive line is intact, if not better. They they might have upgraded with their rookie Dominic Pooney. At I, I believe he's playing right guard. Um, George Kittle obviously is a phenomenal player on the defensive side of the ball. They still have Nick Bosa. They still have Javon Hargrave. They still have uh, actually Hufanga might be injured as well. But they have uh, Traverius Ward and Diamador Lenore, who I think are pretty underrated as cornerbacks in the NFL. Right, so it's like. It's all the same stars you typically associate with the San Francisco 49ers, who have been one of the best teams in the NFL for a handful of years now, right? So it's a really difficult test for the Vikings. It's not something I would have picked them to win heading into it. I'll go through the team a little bit. It's probably not somebody by the end of us that I'm going to pick the Vikings to win against. 
But I, you know, I think that the Vikings showed against the Giants that they sh- are hopefully going to be able to at least put up a competent performance against this 49ers, uh, 49ers team. You know, if, if any of you watch Monday Night Football, you probably saw the 49ers and their backup running back Jordan Mason, who I thought had a pretty good game and is a solid player, run all over the New York Jets. Um, the Jets did not appear to be prepared to stop the run in that game at all. And they, and they really were not prepared by alignment, right? So they were running th- two, three techniques and wide nines basically all game, which is just an invitation for the, for the 49ers to run the ball down in your throat. And if you give the 49ers that invitation, they're going to do it. The Vikings last year against the 49ers were much, much better against the run than that. They, um, allowed only 65 yards on 22 carries. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about last year is that the 49ers offense, you know, they, they lost, they only put up 17 points, but they only punted the ball once. They turned the ball over three times. So Christian McCaffrey fumbled uh, on the first drive, I believe, for the 49ers. And then obviously Brock Purdy had the two back-to-back interceptions to uh, or back-to-back drives with interceptions to end the game. But on the other drives, they either scored or I, I guess they missed a field goal on the one drive and then they punted on only one drive in that game, right? So... That's also not a lot of drives. There were only like eight or nine drives because both teams, you know, were moving the ball pretty effectively and put together long 10 play drives that take up a lot of time off of the clock. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if the Vikings can do a little bit better and maybe force more punts in this game because you can't necessarily count on the turnover luck or, or turnovers to come in the game that they had last year, right? Um, the key to do that. First and foremost, as I mentioned, is stopping the run. Like it's a it's a super cliche thing to say, right? But if if you allow the 49ers to just run the ball on you, they showed against the Jets that they're they are fine. Just almost every snap, uh, handing the ball off and running it down your throat for a hundred, a hundred fifty, two hundred yards, whatever they want to get to. So the Vikings defensive line, I think, comes ready made to stop that better than the Jets did, right? I mentioned the uh, two, three techniques and nine techniques, the Vikings don't do that. I, I mean, I guess we had the Eagles game last year, but um, the Vikings are on base downs, going to put three, you know, interior defense linemen with two edge rushers and then two linebackers behind that. That's a pretty solid run front. Usually they have a safety even rotated down in the box in that case, right? Um, they're going to, you know, I, even... You know, they're, they're going to play pre-snap with the safety in a box a lot with Josh Metellus and Harrison Smith in the box a lot. So you're going to be running into loaded boxes if you, they're, if you're the 49ers. Uh, Harrison Phillips and Jonathan Bullard have been fantastic run defenders. I thought Grenard was pretty good in run defense as well. Jihad Ward is a heavy body that you can put in there. Uh, Van Ginkle isn't as heavy, but he's technically very good in run defense from what I've seen. You know, the Giants weren't able to really get anything going on the ground and they didn't really try all that hard to run the ball. So it's kind of hard to see exactly how these guys are going to mesh, right? And when they were running on the interior, the Vikings were pretty well able to shut that down with their interior uh, defensive linemen. So maybe there's a weakness I'm not sure about, you know, on the on the edge or something. But in all, I think the Vikings are going to be pretty strong against the run and should be well-equipped to at least limit the um, – 49ers offense. I'm not going to say stop the 49ers offense because that's a that's a relatively impossible task, right? Um, you know, you, you flip it over to the passing game. Kyle Shanahan is always going to come up with like a crazy innovative passing game that does a great job of getting guys open. You had Kyle Juszczyk wide open multiple times down the sideline against the Jets last week. Um, so we expect that. I, I guess the you know, thing for the Vikings will be they do a good job of obviously confusing looks. I talked about that with Daniel Jones a little bit earlier. If they can confuse Brock Purdy again in the way that they forced two interceptions against him last year where he's trying to make the anticipation throws and Cam Bynum was able to jump the routes, like that's the way you beat them, right? You trick them into thinking they're seeing one thing and getting the one thing and you do something else. The Vikings are equipped to do that. If they're going to make an upset, they need to be able to jump those balls and make that work. They also leave 
holes in the zone, you know, as we saw towards the end of last year, when you're running that kind of zone coverage. So, you know, the, the 49ers could easily exploit that and throw for a ton of yards, or if they're able to find a way to trick the 49ers and play on Brock Purdy's expectations where he wants to be an anticipatory quarterback, throw the ball to design place on time at the right time. That's how he wins as a football player. If you can trick that, you can, you know, get a couple picks like the Vikings did last year, but it's not a guarantee because the 49ers are a smart team too, right? I think if you're trying to like outplay the weapons, I'm not sure the Vikings have the horses to do that, right? Brandon Ayuk is a top tier NFL receiver to me. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to line up in man coverage, even with this Devon Gilmore or somebody and stop that one-on-one. Debo Samuel isn't that great against man, but his ability after the catch is just incredible. So it's kind of hard to leave him one-on-one, right? You need a ton of people to rally to the ball to try to bring him down. George Kittle is a matchup nightmare. I I don't think the Vikings really have somebody on the field who can match up one-on-one with him. Josh Metellus is probably the closest thing, but I don't think he's a pure man coverage player either, right? So you're going to have to play the zones that I was talking about and kind of just contain this offense from that perspective. Um, you know, uh, another thing that happened last year that the Vikings won't necessarily have to deal with is, you know, Christian McCaffrey screen touchdown. But, hey, Debo Samuel, as I mentioned, is just as effective on the screens. So the 49ers come up with some really interesting screen designs. And while I think the Vikings are generally a very good screen team, a high-level play caller like a Kyle Shanahan or an Andy Reid, uh, you know, with their unique screen designs that are kind of uh, – more interesting. And I, I thought the Christian McCaffrey screen last year was a really interesting screen design to get to that look to kind of catch the Vikings off guard a little bit on the screen compared to what they normally see from triggering on screens could be an impact as well if the Vikings are blitzing a lot in this game. Notably, they did not blitz a ton against the Giants, right? They blitzed at a much lower rate than they did all year last year. And I think that's because of the coverage ability of some of the players they brought in. So, that could be a benefit to the Vikings where they don't have to blitz as much necessarily, but we'll just kind of have to see how it plays out, right? So that's a lot about the Vikings defense against the 49ers offense. If I flip it over to the Vikings offense, you know, I, I think one of the things about the game last year was that Kirk Cousins absolutely played out of his mind in the game. Like he was phenomenal in terms of making anticipatory throws into the deep intermediate ranges of the field, right? That or the intermediate ranges of the field, particularly the middle of the field, you know, he was able to attack extremely effectively with anticipation. That's something that's really hard for a quarterback to do. And I can't overstate that. Like Kirk Cousins was the, you know, textbook quarterback who, if you're able to draw it up on paper, he can execute it, right? And he can see what you're telling him and get that done. I'm not sure if Sam Darnold is here in that offense or is there in this offense yet, right? We had a couple of nice small anticipation throws, I'll say, to Jordan Addison in the last game, but really he wasn't challenged all that much outside of Dexter Lawrence, right? The Giants' coverage was not particularly effective. Like, I don't think they have a lot of guys who are all that good back there. The 49ers have one of the best coverage linebackers in the NFL in Fred Warner. They have a phenomenal physical man corner in Traverius Ward. Diamandor Lenore is pretty good. On the back end, the safeties are, are well coached in general. Uh, Hufanga is a good player, but again, I don't think he's playing. I think he's on IR or something uh, right now. Um, so at the end of the day, right, the... Vikings are going to have to win. If the Vikings want to win in the same way that they did last year, which is like great throws over the middle of the field, Sam Darnold needs to play the lights out, right? And Sam Darnold, if he does that, can prove that he's probably a valid option at the quarterback position for anybody moving forward. Like, if Sam Darnold wants to prove he's as evolved as a quarterback, he needs to go out and beat the coverages that the 49ers are uh, throwing at us and, and just kind of win the day through the air for the Vikings. Um, you know, there, there's a challenge for the offensive line because they've got Nick Bosa, they've got Javon Hargrave. Obviously, containing the interior pressure from Javon Hargrave will be the key. I think 
as far as you can have an advantage against a Nick Bosa-like player, right, who's an elite edge rusher, one of the best edge rushers in the game, a potential game wrecker. The Vikings do in two great tackles in Christian Derrissaw and Brian O'Neill to mitigate that, right? Like, I don't even know if you need to give Christian Derrissaw help against Nick Bosa, which is some of the highest praise you can give anybody in the NFL, right? Like, oh, you don't even really need to help one of the, this tackle against one of the best edge rushers, especially the way Derrissaw was playing um, last week. But you can help O'Neal out with chipping and that sort of thing. And you can do the same for Derrissaw, too. I mean, uh, Bosa's great. There's no shame in, in getting a little help against one of the best players in the uh, NFL there. So, you know, got to stop that pass rush. And then running the ball, I, I think the Vikings do have a little bit of an advantage on that front, um, I, I don't think this 49ers front is, is going to be as good against the run. Like Fred Warner, for as phenomenal as he is in coverage, and he's a great player against the run too. He's a little bit light, so if you can get bodies up to the second level on him, I think you can block him out of the way a little bit. Um, and Javon Hargrave, for as good of a pass rusher he is, isn't really a strong run defender. I don't remember offhand who else the... Uh, 49ers have on their interior defensive line, but Eric Armstead is gone, right? DeForest Buckner obviously has been gone for a while, but he and Eric Armstead were really kind of stalwarts against the run that made it really hard to run on the 49ers in years past because they're like these massive, massive dudes who just can clog up a lane and had pass rush ability, right? Like they're really good players. Um, I don't think the 49ers really have somebody with that size at this point in time. So the run game, which I kind of salivated over with Aaron Jones, might be another key to the game for the Vikings in terms of their ability to consistently move the ball. If you can get five yards a clip in the run game, you can open up the play action game. You can get linebackers to trigger forward more and kind of help Sam Darnold in that intermediate middle of the field make some of that anticipation throws. Maybe you can open up the windows a little bit more, right? Um, I still think, ultimately, the ability to make those throws, the ability to move the ball through the air, is going to be the key in the game. But you can kind of see how running the ball a little bit might help open that up, right? Because the Vikings were able to do that last year without running the ball successfully because of Kirk Cousins' ability. Um, I think to get Sam Darnold to that level, you probably have to run the ball a little bit better than you did last year, um, where they only averaged like three yards a clip. Uh, but, you know, if somebody can do that, I think it's Aaron Jones and this new look Vikings uh, off a, or offensive run game. Right, like their offensive line isn't new, obviously, but I think they have added a little bit of spice to the run game by going to more counter plays, duo plays, those kind of gap scheme plays. Um, so overall summary against the 49ers, I mean, I I would pick the 49ers to beat the Vikings. Still, obviously, they're coming to Minnesota. They don't have Christian McCaffrey, but they're just a better team across the board. Like, especially with Jordan Addison out. They're better in the pass uh, – with Jordan Addison and TJ Hawkinson out, I should say, because TJ Hawkinson is still on IR, they have better pass catching options. They obviously have a, the second best run game. Like, they are a top two non-run-involved quarterback run game design in the NFL with the Miami Dolphins, who obviously Mike, McD Mike uh, McDaniel comes from the Kyle Shanahan tree, right? They're a phenomenal run game design. They're going to have a better run game than the Vikings, most likely in this game. Um, their offensive line might be a wash, right? Trent Williams is who Christian Darrisaw is, is trying to become. Uh, Brian O'Neill's better than Colton Kivitz, their right tackle. The anterior offensive line, you know, young and promising, I would say, for the 49ers, or, or promising from, from the Derek Pooney perspective. The Vikings, we probably have a little bit more questions about, but I, I think it kind of all evens out in the wash there where that's kind of a, a wash. On the defensive side of the ball, I just think the pass rush potential from both Bosa and Hargrave probably beats out the combination of pass rush from the Vikings and, and the run defense there, although run defense might be a little bit of a weak link. Uh, linebackers, obviously, Fred Warner is like the best linebacker in the game. And secondary, I'd still give the edge to the 49ers, although it's a little bit close, right? So across the board, I think the 49ers really are equal or better than the Minnesota Vikings. I would predict that they win this game, but I do see a path for the Vikings to beat them 
because it, it's basically following the path that we did last year. Confuse Brock Purdy a little bit. Be solid against the run. Like, first of all, stop the run from damaging you. And then you have to force Brock Purdy to throw the ball and confuse him when he has to do that, which is not easy to do, right? There's a reason this is one of the most effective passing offenses in the NFL. But, uh, again, you're playing against a team with Super Bowl uh, aspirations. You have to play a dominant football game in order to win or get a bunch of fluky luck, but we can't count on, on flukes, right? So... Very tough matchup against the 49ers. I wouldn't expect the Vikings to win, but I think they can at least be a competitive team against them. And if we see a competitive game, I think we're in for a really nice season, probably beating expectations a little bit for the Vikings. So that's really what I'm hoping for in this game. Um, and with that, I'm going to wrap it up here. Uh, my name is Matt Freese. You can find me at Fries Football on Twitter. Nick is at Nichols in NFL. Uh, we're, we're hoping to get him back on the podcast Maybe late in the year this year. Uh, you can find us at Kindred Skulls on Twitter. We're available on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on video at Kindred Skulls. Uh, by the way, I haven't done video for the past couple. I need to get the graphic redesigned if I want to just do it as one person. I've kind of been procrastinating on that for a little bit. So I'm going to try to get that done and we'll try to see if I can get myself on video uh, for the YouTube here in a little bit. Um, and with that, Skull Vikings. <laughs>